would I tell younger Tom? Honestly, I don't think I would tell him anything. I think I would just let him run amok with the world like he's been doing. <laughs> that, that is also my answer, by the way, to myself. So I, I, I hear you I there. I hope that's not too unusual. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> I've been thinking about covering today's topic for years and years on the podcast, and it's thanks to Krista Copper helping out with archiving and cataloging all these episodes that I'm finally able to do it. I'm Jason Heath, this is Contra Race Conversations, and we are covering the question that I now typically ask my podcast guests at the end of our interview, which is what advice would you give your younger self or some variant thereof? I first started asking this about two years ago, so the first nine years of a podcast never had this question, but it is a good launching point for several interesting discussions. And at this point, I've asked it of many, many people. So you're going to hear a wide range of people from Christian McBride to Susan Wolf to David Allen Moore, Renan Meyer, Melody Chia, Jackie Pickett, and many, many others. I think we have a total of 30 perspectives on what advice would you give young people? What advice would you give your younger self? And I think you're really going to have fun with this episode. And obviously, this podcast is called Contra Bass Conversations. And yes, we are getting advice from bass players. But I think it goes without saying, this advice is not specific to bass. It applies to anybody. So if you have somebody you know in your life that you think would benefit from this, go ahead and pass it along. And though I'm framing it as advice for young musicians, of course, it's advice that I heed on a regular basis and it applies to anybody at any stage of their career. I'd like to give a shout out to our sponsors, Colstein Music, a new sponsor. So great to have Barry and all the other folks at Colstein on board and our longtime sponsors, Diderio Strings, Upton Bass, and Robertson and & Sons. More on all of them later. But let's dig into this best of episode, starting off with the great Christian McBride, who I finally had on the podcast. I, I might have been, I might have gotten physical with okay. the uh, 18-year-old Christian. I would, like, would have grabbed him by the collar and jacked him up against the wall and be like, look, man, develop some discipline. <laughs> really? You know, it, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. In terms of because bass or, yeah, or just in general? Or? Everything. Okay. Everything. Um, I mean, I realized that not being in, in college, because um, I only stayed at Juilliard for one year from September of 89 to May of 90, and I was still 17. I didn't turn 18 until the end of May 1990. Uh, so between... That time, you know, I started playing with Freddie Hubbard, was playing with Benny Golson, was playing with Bobby Watson. I was doing all these gigs, but in between those gigs, I was just being an 18-year-old. And I, and I guess in retrospect, I, I, maybe I wouldn't have grabbed 18-year-old Christian by the collar, but I would have <laughs> definitely put my finger in his face and said, look, man, you know, I know you're having fun doing all these gigs, but, you know, get a routine going. Stop showing up late for all your gigs. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, I, I really would have been, I, w I would have, uh, remember the movie Lean On Me? Oh, yeah, of With course. Morgan Freeman? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would have, I would have been my own Joe Clark. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I would have made myself sing the school song, you know, and uh, get up at nine in the morning and do some jumping jacks. You know, that's, that's the kind of discipline I would have, would have needed. Next up is Susan Wolf, longtime friend, assistant principal based in the San Diego Symphony, great dancer, and obviously bassist and super cool all around person. Patience mm -hmm. and scales. <laughs> Patience and scales. Nice. <laughs> scales. They're really good, especially with a drone. <laughs> <laughs> I always hated practicing my scales in college, and now it's something I love to do. It's so funny. It's irony, isn't it? But yeah, I would say patience. And if you're continually working on something and doing the best you can, sooner or later, 
it's going to come to fruition. Mm -hmm. That's just the laws of life. Yeah. You know, you put your energy in a particular motion, it's, it's sooner or later going to reach it. And I think in college, there's a lot of anxiety, you, a lot of unknowns. You have no idea what's going to happen. And so there's this stress that we create of, oh my gosh, I need to do this now, or where is this going to end up? And I would definitely tell my younger self, hey, don't worry about that. Mm -hmm. Just stay the course. Just stay mm -hmm. the course. Put the work in. Put the energy in. You'll be fine. Next, we have Peter Seymour of Project Trio, who I've had on the podcast a couple of times. This was from our more recent interview, and it's just a great pump me up, get you raring to go. Listen to this clip before you start practicing, and you'll really get some good things done. Be as great as the instrument as you can be. And that's why I, I you know, I wouldn't change too much, except I would have even worked harder, you know, and I, and so, um, because I think no matter what, path you take musically you have to try to be you know you have to aspire to be playing at the highest level and also as as all of us know who are now older as you get older there is less and less time to practice and so i think that when you're 18 you know just just diving in and just playing as much as possible now if I could have done anything different, I think that I would have done more um, performing and actual getting out there and playing. So many times as bass players, we do one or two recitals. We go out and play a handful of auditions, be it five or 20. And then we play a few chamber music recitals over the year. But really, when does anybody actually hear you play? Not that much because when we sit in the section, it's an, I love sitting in a bass section, but no one hears you. And so I think so often, you know, for your recital or for your audition, I, I was always so nervous and I think it, you know, didn't help. And it didn't have me playing great auditions or great recitals. It was because I didn't practice performing enough. And so I think that's the main thing I would have changed is that get out there and play. And it doesn't matter. A performance is a performance is a performance. If you're playing for a group of first graders at the local elementary school, or you're playing at the veteran hospital or the community center, or you're playing a concert for your friends and peers or you're playing an open recital or an open mic it's the same experience it's the same feeling that you get when i still go in and play in a really large concert hall now and actually over the last 10 years i've become so much more confident and it's because i play tons of concerts where basically i am the bass player so if I am messing up, you're going to know it. You know what I mean? Whereas I spent a long time before, I felt for me personally, I was doing a lot of hiding in the bass section. And I and I, so I think just get out and perform. Next up is Carlos Henriquez, the great jazz bass player with some advice for his younger self. Well, if I would go back to me at 18, I would tell myself to, um, hmm, Wow. I would tell myself to be patient uh -huh. and not to, uh, I would tell myself to be patient and to not worry about what's happening musically and just to, you know, learn music and to enjoy music and to ask as many questions as you can to all the elder musicians because I was able to hang out with a lot of the older jazz musicians and um, Latin musicians who passed away, but I didn't get to ask them those right questions, you know? Mm -hmm. Like how it was before the amplifier, you know? And all these little, you know, tricks of how do you get a bigger bass sound? You know, do you move against the corner, set up against the wall? You know, there were stories about bass, you know, Bobby Rodriguez having to record his bass in a corner of a studio so that the bass sound off the wall can, you know, Give a little enhancement, you know, just little things like that. And uh, but the key is to be patient. Mm -hmm. You know, the one thing you, you you forget is that when you're young, you 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 rush very hard to be old. You know, and when you start getting to that age where you start becoming 
somebody who you looked at and you looked up to, then you start saying, wow, look how fast I got up to this level. You know, sometimes when you're young, it's better to say, take your time, enjoy it, learn, and have fun, you know? Yeah, that's great. Holstein Music has been supplying the bass world and the music world in general at this point with great services and products for over 60 years. It was started by Samuel Colstein and has been run by Barry Colstein, who I've had on the podcast. And, and they are just such a great company for anything you need for basses. They've got a great selection of instruments. They've got a great selection of bows, accessories, and just a great bunch of people working behind the scenes. Barry has been a true friend to the bass community for so long, and it's so great to have Colstein supporting the podcast. Learn more about everything that they do at Colstein.com. Hey, everybody. This is Kieran Hanlon from the State University of New York at Fredonia. Um, Coming, uh, coming to you all today to uh, contribute to Jason's blog about Diodario strings. Uh, so I teach here at Fredonia. Um, I play a lot of different kinds of music. I'm a very serious orchestra guy. I play principal bass for the Erie Philharmonic, and I'm a substitute for Detroit Chautauqua Symphony, um, uh, Buffalo Philharmonic, Rochester Philharmonic. I do a lot of uh, jazz playing in the region here, and uh, and also of course solo playing as well for. Uh, you know, faculty recitals, things like of that nature here at, at Fredonia. Uh, so I, uh, I really need strings that can do a lot of different things. It's one of the one of my favorite things about the Diodario uh, Helicor orchestras, which is what I play on primarily. So I am a Diodario artist. Um, I chose to do that uh, for a number of different reasons, uh, which will sort of be outlined here as I go on. So I have two instruments. Uh, I have uh, a really big 7 8 bass that I use for classical playing, solo and orchestra. That's a Mike Griffin bass. Uh, and uh, that bass has a beautiful dark tone naturally. And so it can take a, a brighter string, um, and it actually needs a brighter string to gain clarity, particularly in the low register. So uh, I use the helico orchestras on it, medium tension. I've tried heavy tension. Uh, that was a little bit too much. Um, and I think light would be a little bit too floppy. So the medium is totally great for that. So if you have a big dark bass, the helical orchestras tend to work out really well. A number of my students here play on uh, very nice Shen instruments, and they tend to enjoy the helical orchestras as well. Um, now, one of the things we all need to think about, like I was just saying, I have a big dark bass, I need a brighter string. If you have the inverse situation where you have an instrument that's pretty bright um, naturally, then it can be nice to uh, try, you know, something like a Diodario Kaplan, which is a little darker, and will uh, will just kind of add a little bit of warmth if your instrument is naturally pretty bright. Uh, so that's my classical setup. Um, on my my jazz instrument is a Christopher bass uh, shop model. It's a five string actually, which is really fun. And at this point, I'm using Helicor orchestras on that as well. I did use the pizzicatos for a long time, and I, I really still enjoy those strings, but I was involved with uh, some more swing era uh, playing, and I was looking for uh, basically not as much sustain, so I could really control the uh, the notes for the groove, the kind of walking playing, that sort of old school short short note kind of thing. Uh, and the uh, pizzicatos were a little bit too hit a little bit too much sustain for that. I really did enjoy the strings, though, uh, particularly for soloing. So, you know, sometimes if I'm doing something more modern, I will switch back to those guys. Um, additional things about Diodara that are great, customer service, you know, Lyris Hung is the uh, uh, rep, you know, that I deal with, and uh, she's great, easy to get in touch with, uh, always, you know, very uh, quick with getting strings out. Um, the price of the strings, I think, is really can't be beaten, you know, um, it's just a really, really great value. And uh, also, they've, uh, the company's been very supportive of, of events here at Fredonia, namely Bass Fest, uh, which is our big kind of yearly uh, mini ISB, you might say, we have for a day with, uh, you know, a couple of usually very high-profile guests. And I'm 100% sure that without uh, the company's support, that event would not be happening. So love the company, love the product, um, really, uh, really a big fan. So if uh, you have any further questions about the uh, the strings uh, or the company or whatever, feel free to shoot an email to me. You can find my email on the Fredonia website. 
Um, okay, take care. Next up is my conversation with Berlin Philharmonic principal bassist Matthew McDonald. Matt's a great guy. This is one of the most popular, remains one of the most popular recent episodes, and it's a great response to the what would you advise a young musician or your younger self? Definitely to be less less cocky, okay. less arrogant. I think there are times that I was being given good advice, but I wasn't ready for it and dismissed it too quickly because I felt too insecure, probably. Also, to practice intonation more carefully, to really, to really listen. I think there are a few years I kind of probably grew a little deaf to my own intonation. But on the other hand, if I had have gotten a sort of intonation, I may have really lost my way as a musician. So that's, that's hard to say. Because on the other hand, I can imagine that I think I probably would have lost my um, enthusiasm for the instrument if I had have only been thinking about that. But I think that's really important to be to be open and to try and see where someone is coming from. Even if it's even if you know it's not your thing, there's I find there's always something in someone's teaching or playing that you can take for yourself. I mean, now I'm greedy with it. Now I go to master classes and look on the internet and all that stuff. I'll just take I'm like a greedy person at a buffet now. <laughs> Next, we've got a conversation, a more recent one, with Lois Robinson, who is the executive director of the Shreveport Symphony and is also a bassist in the Shreveport Symphony section. This is great advice both for people thinking about a music degree or anybody who wants to have music as a part of their lives. People of all ages listen to this, but a lot of young people listen to this, like 16, 17 year old. 18 year olds, people that are figuring out what they want to do. And let's say someone's listening to this and is thinking about a career in the arts. You mentioned, you know, the, how for so many years, music schools, it's like you're either in the Cleveland Orchestra or you're nothing, right? That Hopefully right, that's changing. Right. But like, what might you tell some of those young people or their parents? We have a lot of parents <laughs> that listen. Um, what might you tell them just about options in the arts uh, right now? Well, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, as you said, it, it, it's it's not an all or nothing proposition. Mm -hmm. There there are way you develop skills in the arts that are uh, very applicable to help you succeed in any number of places. So, uh, I went straight from music school to law school, it, mm -hmm. and it was fine. It was fine. Um, and so, for parents who might think, oh, well, this is this is money thro thrown down the drain uh, if their kid wants to go to uh, uh, into an arts program. Either either they will get into the Cleveland Orchestra, which is great. That's one way to succeed. Or they can find they can use the skills they learn, uh, the intuitive and listening and, um, uh, you know, high brain function skills that you learn in arts uh, can help you in any number of ways, in any number of pursuits. Um, and also to the kids, as I said before, give yourself permission to feel successful uh, in any number of ways. There's, there, there's not just one definition of success. Here's some great general advice, mindset advice from Eric Hansen, bass professor at Brigham Young University. We're part of a centuries-old tradition. It's such a blessing to be a musician. And, and all of our practicing, it's not about logging practice hours. We're, we're, we're part of this. It's a craft. You know, it's, it's hard to put into words. You know, it, I, I sat with you to a little while ago and we played with Hilary Hahn. You know, and, and you watch that kind of artistry. And, and then that, that makes me want to go to the practice room because I want to play like Hillary when I grow up, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or, and so anyway, so I, Hal's version of the dinners, I mean, the Dragonetti was transformative because, you know, you hear students, you most often hear students do it. Right. And, and when he played it, it was a completely different piece. I, I really, I, to this day, I still remember the thing. I was just slack jawed watching him play thinking, that's how the dragon, it sounded like Haydn. It was so 
beautiful and so engaging that I, you know, from then on, I thought, okay, I'm never approaching that piece the same way. And, and but it, it, that idea that everything that we're trying to do is is that that almost unspeakable, unverbalizable. There's a good word for you. <laughs> we, you know, it's hard to put into words the joy and the satisfaction we feel participating in this art form. Next up, we've got some footage from a couple of recent live events. This first one is from our Luthier Roundtable. You're going to be hearing from Mitch Mooring, who helps produce these podcasts, as well as Arnold Schnitzer and David Gage. Advice for everybody, but of course, tailored toward people thinking about something in the Luthier world. This is Mitch. I would give myself advice to, um, saying that this is actually a career, um, that this is something that people do. I, I never really thought that there were, you know, I didn't really even know there were luthiers. I played a terrible bass in high school. Um, and that's kind of how I got into it. I just did some work on my instrument and I had no idea that there were people that did this full time. So I just tell myself, you don't have to wait until you're 30 or, you know, mid 20s to do this. You can you know, you go into it instead of college. Bring back shop classes. The <laughs> <laughs> uh, young musician practice, make sure you just go to the shed and keep, keep practicing like, like everyone here tries to do, is doing. And um, going back to what these guys are saying, yeah, bring your instrument in to a good luthier and trust them and, and trust them. You know, bring it in so people can really look at it as the seasons change. And, and, and I've seen people come in with this, but they've been suffering for years. And you go, what have you been doing? He's been, you know, oh yeah, it was like bass doesn't play, it hasn't played for, you bring it in, do a few changes, it's great. And then they, you know, it's, it's important to keep these things maintained. Here is a clip from our 500th episode, which we did live in San Francisco at the Golden Gate Base Camp. This features Donovan Stokes and Bill Gould of Faith No More, both answering that question. What advice would you give your younger self? What advice would you give your 18-year-old self? And I'd love to hear the answer to that from, from both of you. Uh, Donovan. Well, um, my process was from delinquent to legit, like, you know, uh, and so at 18, I'd probably say, uh, stop drinking, uh, don't drink and drive, go to class, um, that sort of thing. <laughs> Do you think your 18-year-old self would have listened to you? Absolutely not, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to hear that argument, though, yeah. between the two. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's... You get your life in order, I guess, would have been the thing. It really has nothing to do with music, but pretty much once my life was in order, the music was easier. So, uh, I would say that back when I was 18, everything that happened, you know, now or next week was everything. And, and just that uh, when you decide to do something, um, do something that, you know, you think you're going to, you do it because you like it and you want to keep doing it. Do something that you want to keep doing. Next up is Jacqueline Pickett, Jackie Pickett, who I had so much fun chatting with. Very popular episode from earlier this year. Jackie teaches down at Columbus State University in Georgia and does so many other things. Definitely check out that interview. And here's Jackie's advice for her younger self. Jackie, <laughs> this is what my mother said to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I never really had much chance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if I'm going to go back. Uh no, Jackie, just 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 do do your best and always be when you do your best, you're always going to feel like it's okay. That's it. Joe McFadden, principal bass of the Atlanta Symphony, had some great advice actually for himself 5 years ago, and it's framed really interestingly in the episode the full episode with joe but this is great advice for recent joe not 18 year old joe if i could give advice to to myself at any point it would actually be like like four or five years ago like just like mm. the last like four or five years really? you know yeah. yeah cause like because that's when i was like you know kind of like trying to change my instincts in a way mm. and like ignoring my instincts or trying to think like well i would just be better if i could hone things in this way a little bit more or something like that and which just wasn't working, you know, it just was so inconsistent. And, um, I think I would tell myself to, to be, be who you are as a player, you know, just, 
You know, if if things feel good this way, then do it that way. You know, but if you don't, if if you're if you're trying to be somebody you're not, you know, um, it's never gonna feel good. And if it doesn't feel good, it probably doesn't sound good. You know, if it feels good, it probably sounds good. I, yeah. I love I love that. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be thinking about that in rehearsal today. Actually, I think yeah. it's a really good. Sure to yourself. You know? <laughs> <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Robertson and Sons Violin Shop, and they have been serving the string community and the bass community for decades. Here's Don Robertson about the genesis of the chromatic C extension. Were you the first to do that? As as far as I know, I I did the first chromatic extension on, uh, on Paul Ellison's bass. Yeah. We were up here several days, day and night, in a row to figure this thing out, and we uh, came up with this swivel capo style, and uh, I, th- I think Paul's was first, and um, Edgar Meyer was second when we did. Learn more about their chromatic extensions, bases they've got in stock, and everything else that they do at robertsonviolins.com. One thing that has impressed me about Upton Bass ever since I got to know them was how many artists there are out there that are so satisfied with the work that Upton has done for them. Here's Mark Ramirez on his experiences having Upton copy his beautiful Cavani bass. I do a lot of uh, moving around and giving master classes and stuff like this. I had a, a copy made of it by uh, by the Uptons, by Gary and uh, Eric Roy uh, at, the Upton, at the Upton shop. Um, they made a copy of it, but they made an even smaller copy. I think it's a seven-eighths copy of the bass. Uh, I use it now. I use that bass for my solo playing, mm-hmm. uh, which, which I do a lot. Recently, I've been doing a lot, especially here, and it uh, has a detachable neck. The detachable neck, man, I tell you, in Europe... It's the craze. Learn more at UptonBase.com. And thanks for sponsoring the podcast, guys. Next up is Jeff Newman, bassist, conductor, educator, living in Las Vegas with advice for his younger self, especially geared towards people who might be thinking about music education. And it's advice I wish I had heeded. First of all, I don't know if I would change much of what I've done as far as, you know, getting, I mean, I'm, I feel very lucky to 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 have a life in music and and get to perform and teach and be a, be involved with people like you and and you know and just it's like it's it's amazing to me that this is what I do um, but I would probably say I would probably have my piano chops be, to be nice. better nice. Yeah, yeah I I think that's the one thing I regret and and composing more too there was a period where I, where I was composing um, and just a little bit and you know some rock tunes and some um, and even some other things and and I I feel like Piano and composing are two things that that I definitely wish that I would have put more effort into previously. Even though it's not yeah. never too late, but um, but certainly something that you know now if I ever any regrets, it's that. I've really enjoyed getting to know Melody Chia, who's up next here. Had her on the podcast a few months ago. She's made this really cool transition from being in marketing into making shoes and playing bass the whole time. Here's Melody's advice for her younger self. I think it would be just have done what what you've done. It's I don't that's it's kind of weird because I I don't think I would change anything that I've done with the bass. Mm-hmm. It's been a really sort of nice journey of discovery yeah. because it was unexpected. Maybe the piece of advice would just be to just keep an open mind and just let let things sort of develop as they as they will. Next, we've got Steve Tramontosi, associate principal bass of the San Francisco Symphony, teaches at the conservatory here in town. Got a chance to hang out with him backstage and chat about his career, and here's Steve's words for his younger self. I think that, you know, it's interesting because I, I do look back from time to time and I feel like, um, well, if only I'd done this or if only I'd done that. But, you know, the journey is the journey. And, you know, you you had to have made that mistake in order to now be where you are or you had to have experienced such and such um so uh i guess i would i don't know what i t- <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what i tell myself either so i don't <laughs> right. i just, i think believe in yourself is really yeah. important you know just really i and there were times when i really doubted myself you know but when i didn't then things happened for me 
you know, when I really believed in it. Um, I, like, for instance, when, when I was studying in San Francisco before getting into the symphony, I went to a San Francisco symphony concert. It was Mahler II, I think. And I was sitting in the balcony of the opera house listening to this, and I was just so uh, enthralled by that music and the, and the way they were bringing it to life. I said to myself, I'm going to get in that orchestra. <laughs> so, and I did, like a few months later. So I just, I think that if you just believe in yourself, yeah. uh, it's really important. Next, we've got Marek Romanovsky, who I spent a week with in 2017 at the Bratisic competition in Dallas. Great guy, great player. One of the finalists for that event, got the second prize. And here's Marek's advice. That's a good question because... It's not only one advice I would like to give, but yeah. uh, the I think the most important thing is, of course, to practice a lot. Practice a lot, as much as you can. Use your time because uh, when you will finish studies and you will start to work, there you will you won't have too much time to <laughs> to practice, and so then you will start really to uh, to understand what a great possibility is to have one day just to practice and not doing anything mm -hmm. else. This is the one thing. And the other thing is don't be afraid to search for a new program, new repertoire, because it's really developing and really works on your imagination of also opening a huge gate to improve your technique. Don't be don't be worried to play hard pieces or don't don't listen to people if they say oh no it won't sound on double bass good because they are just jealous just do your thing and use your imagination to push it as as much as you can and do as much competitions as you can as well because it's not uh, about the winning it's not about you know being the best on every competition but it really makes a lot of pro a lot of great things to your playing it really gives you a lot of progress and motivates you to practice more and more. And also, thanks to that, you have a contact with a double bass player around, players around the world. So you are starting to be a really uh, active member of all the society. Micah Howard of the Pittsburgh Symphony shares advice about those formative years. I don't really uh, live with a lot of regret. I, you know... Um, I love my kids, so I'm so happy that I got married and I have my kids, and you know it's wonderful. Uh, my son is in the Air Force in, in Las Vegas, and my stepdaughter uh, works for a hedge fund as a as an attorney in New York City, and I would not ch um, change that for the world having them. But you know, when you do get married at a young age, it puts a lot of strain on your career uh, on your career, no matter what it is. Mm -hmm. So you know. Um, and um, I, I actually have a student right now who's married and who's managing it very, very well. But it's difficult when you get married and you try to pursue especially something like this where it's really a high-risk profession. You put all this time into it, but it – Things may never work out the way that you hoped that they would. Pascal Delash Feldman, who keeps busy in the Northeast, playing and teaching in all sorts of different groups and organizations, shares some advice for her younger self. Well, one thing I would say, uh, is I was very stubborn, so I would say, you know, just be more open-minded, um, be more flexible, listen to, to what people have to say more. I was so stubborn then. <laughs> Um, and definitely, you know, being more flexible um, and, you know, um, just you never know who you're going to meet, you know, who's, you know, who's going to help you. And, and you know, I didn't have really have a plan of what I wanted to do with my career. I know I knew I liked very much solo playing and chamber music. Um, and that's what I did quite a bit for a long time. Um and uh, although, I, you know, I've played also orchestra, but that was the big thing for me. Um, but, you know, I didn't really plan too much because I didn't want to put pressure on myself. And I think that's very important to keep that flexibility and that open mind um, so that you just never know what can happen. 
Corey Brown, the founder of NoTrouble.com and who's done so many other cool things in the tech world and in the base world, shares some advice about the unique path he's taken and some lessons learned along the way. Oh, man. Well, <laughs> um, <laughs> the 20-year-old Corey got thrown out of college. Uh, you know, I, I it's tough because I think that the way my career went you know, I was always going to get thrown out of college because I never fit in with the lines and the, you know, whatever. I, I think that I would call myself like a meat and potatoes bass player. Uh -huh. And I think that if I had to go back, knowing what I know now, and then certainly what I've learned from other people and, and, and our contributors and everything else, I, I think I would have probably spent more time broadening my horizons on the bass. The career really took over and there was, there was a long period of time where I didn't touch a bass and I, I got back into it. Yeah, I think that I think that would be it because the harder I work, if I pick up a bass at the end of the day, you know, I just naturally feel better. Yeah. Um yeah. and and I I I kind of lost that for for many years while I was trying to build my career and trying to pay the bills. Um but uh in terms of the way my career went and panned out, it was hard. I don't have any regrets. You know, I'm glad the way it turned out. I I guess most people would say, try to talk this kid into going to class and, and <laughs> making the attendance portion of the, the grade. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know how that would have benefited me one way or the other, right. you know. Craig Butterfield, who also incidentally went to North Texas, is such a fascinating musician. He teaches bass at the University of South Carolina and he is a burning new grass solo player he's it's just phenomenal what he's doing on the bass right now i'm such a fan definitely check out his playing if you haven't and here's craig's advice which he frequently shares with parents and students i think that this is a really good advice i, I give this out all the time i think music is a very challenging career i think you know you've written a lot about the challenges of making a living as a, as a musician and as a bass player and and uh i think a lot of musicians are struggling with this idea of how are we going to make a living? You know, how are we going to pay the bills playing bass or playing this style of music that I want to play? And as a university professor, the question I probably get asked most often by parents of prospective students is, you know, how is my son or daughter or grandson, granddaughter going to make a living? You know, are they, are there jobs out there? Are there opportunities out there? And I always think back to my my colleagues when I was a student at North Texas, and there was a pretty you know we were a very close knit bass studio and and there was you know ten or eight or ten or twelve of us that were just really good friends and we'd hang out talk bass talk rosin talk strings you know bass covers bass wheels whatever you want to talk about we talked about it for hours and hours and we were all different we were all totally different in what we wanted to do and I can't think of one of us that didn't kind of end up doing what we want to do. I think we obviously had a great teacher and we were at a, a good program, but I think if you have a clear vision of what you want to do and you work hard and you, you know, you've got to have some foundation of early, early training is really helpful. Um, I don't know if there's any sort such thing as sort of affinity to, to music or whatever, but if there is, of course, that would, that would help too. But I think if you have a clear vision of what you want and you work really hard towards your goal, I, I think that you're going to be successful. And I think that if people kind of have that in mind, that's that's an extremely uh, beneficial outlook to have. Celito de Jesus runs the Raboth Institute, Los Angeles. She teaches in the Southern California area, has a ton of students that she works with each and every week. And she just put out a course on musicianstoolkit.com, a company that I work with. Super interesting artist. And here is Celito's advice. I think... I would just tell myself to just enjoy um, playing the instrument and not worry so much about comparing yourself to others. And that's um, another great Raboth saying that I always remember. He's, he would always tell us, you know, never compare yourself with anyone. Just be better than yourself. And I think that pressure that we put on ourselves, so I have to be better than so-and-so, it's just not really beneficial. Just focus on yourself and see what you can do the next day to be better. And that's such a great um um, lesson that Francois taught me is just be better than yourself every day. 
Sandor Ostland, who teaches bass at Baylor University, has some wonderful advice that he shares. Uh, looking back, I made a ton of mistakes, you yeah. know? I don't know, like learning orchestral repertoire a whole step off. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's going to scar you for life. Yeah, and, and I, so I, I think it's okay now, but it, it wasn't the most efficient path. Yeah. Certainly it wasn't the most efficient path. At the same time, I was kind of happy to go kind of a circuitous route, yeah. you know, and figuring stuff out. And, and you know, Richard in particular, let me kind of skate around stuff. And I think I had some of this naturally, like I, I would practice hard. I had, I had that sort of inherent mm-hmm. um, and being willing to kind of lock myself in the practice room and, and hearing stories of Richard that was eight hours a day. And, yeah. you know, then you hear like all his friends, Dolphy and all these people who were just like, so I was just like, I want to be like that. Yeah. So I, I think the hard work part of it is important. I, I think w- one of the things I, I wish I had thought of is that my professional life started the minute I walked into to university mm. you know, and That's really great. thinking like th- these people are the people I might be working with in the future and really thinking, you know, that it's not just about how well you play the instrument. It's about how you, you interact with the people around you and the music making and, and making opportunities like that. So a, a bigger awareness of that, I think, is, is important now. And it would have been good for me then, I think. David Hayes is a bassist, composer, and the founder of RecitalMusic.net. You've almost certainly bought music from him at some point over the years. He's published so much great work by composers like Simon Garcia, Bernard Salles, and himself as well. And he has a great perspective on the bass world and how the internet has encouraged community and collaboration. And then those, this isn't specifically advice for young people. I think it's just great perspective on how things are shifting and changing. I think passionate bass players and passionate people are always there. But I think the internet has made it easier for us all to connect. And I think that's the difference. I think it's completely changed because there were lots of people commissioning and lots of people doing what I do and more. But then suddenly we're all connected. And it's fantastic to see what you're doing and what Dan is doing and what Gabriella is doing, what Teppo is doing. And it's, I love it. I love, and I like information. I love knowledge. I love knowing what everybody else is doing. Because I always think, is that an idea I could use? Would my students benefit from that? Um, is that something else I can move forward or or something. And I, I just love it all. David Allen Moore of the Los Angeles Philharmonic and USC is next. And I'm almost positive I've used this quote in a highlight episode before, but that's okay. It's a fantastic interview. I drove down to Los Angeles a couple of years ago pretty much to do this interview with David and it did not disappoint. It's so great. And so this is very specific advice about getting better at your craft. And yes, it applies to bass playing and music making, but really I think it applies to getting better at any skill in life. The idea of not shying away from looking at your shortcomings, but actually making that purposely one of your aspirations like I want to find these things like you're going on a you know an expedition to find these things and when you find it like don't shy away and don't plug your nose but like stare at it with your eyes wide open and you know inhale deeply (laughs) really see what it is and then and then when you build that into being a quality that you you possess because you can make those kinds of choices of like what qualities you possess in that way it doesn't become as frightening and it doesn't become as painful because you get excited about it of like, okay, I can see that now so I can fix it. I'm not, I'm not looking away from it. I'm not trying to put a soft focus lens on it. I'm looking at it in like fluorescent lights and I can see every, every bit of nastiness. That being said, and this is something I, I've kind of been really focused on a lot lately, is you have to also revel in your successes and, and, and enjoy the things that go well because I see it a lot with students and it, it, it hurts. It hurts me to see that because the way that, you know, we're conditioned to, to practice, like I'm, and here I am like telling you to do that, <laughs> to like look, look at all the, the harsh realities of what you're doing. But then is, you know, we're basically putting ourselves in a small room and tell, and trying to enumerate all the ways in which we suck. You know, like that's, you're doing that for hours and hours a day. And I've made the analogy of, you know, you would never go home and say, okay, I'm going to go home and look at myself in the mirror for four hours and just point out every physical shortcoming I have and everything about my personality that is, I dislike. I mean, you would, you'd throw yourself off a cliff at some point. It would just be horrible. There would be no way to do that. But we're doing that with, with our music, which is something that we hold very close to ourselves personally. We identify with it very closely. And so if you don't take 
joy and satisfaction in the successes, however small they are, it's hard to come back the next day. It's hard to come back for more abuse of just more of more of the uh, yes enjoyment of your own excrement. Carmen Rodriguez is a bassist originally from Panama that's been studying in the United States for the last several years, and she has advice specifically about what to do if you want to go study in a foreign country and especially if you want to come from Latin America or other places to come study in the United States. First, I would like to to say that it's possible. Many, many times we think it's kind of impossible and that we are not good enough to do that. I feel like most of Latin Americans or I don't know if most of Latin Americans, but at, at least in Central America, we think that we are not good enough because, you know, the maybe the education is is not like highest standard like in the United States musically. So if they have the opportunity to go to festivals that have professors from other countries and talk to them and, you know, look for information in the Internet, it's amazing. The Internet right now, it's like you can have all the information on the tools that you will ever imagine you can look for the emails and talk to them by email and also for united states the language is a really big thing it can be an issue for most of the of the people that would like to study abroad so take english courses <laughs> and practice the most that you can because the TOEFL is not easy Usually that's kind of a barrier for most of the people that would like to come. Chris Hanulek, principal bassist of the LA Phil, has this advice to share. You know, I've been blessed, Jason. Yeah. I, I, I really have been. I, 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 I'm living, I've, I've, I feel like I've been living a dream yeah. <laughs> for, the, for the past 30 years. I, I think the, the, the key to, that, that I would remind myself as a 20-year-old is to stay open. Mm-hmm. Stay open to new ideas. Stay open to new concepts. Yeah. Stay open to new music. Stay open to new players. Mm -hmm. Stay open and and listening. Always listening. Yeah. yeah. Whether it's an instrumentalist, whether it's a vocalist, whatever the case may be, whether it's classical music mm -hmm. or jazz or rock or fusion or whatever, to stay open. Mm -hmm. Because I think um, when you get into a job like you know, the Los Angeles Philharmonic, it's very easy to kind of, that focus to become much more narrow. Yeah. You know, you're wrapped up in day to day, week to week, you know, uh, what's on the schedule this week that very often it's like, you, you forget about yeah. what, what else is happening. Caleb Quillen won a spot in the bass section of the Kansas City Symphony a few years ago, and I actually saw him play in high school. He had a bass solo. His orchestra came to the Midwest Clinic, and I remember sitting next to his teacher, Dennis Whitaker, another past podcast guest, and listening to Caleb play. It was so cool to chat with him many years later for the podcast, and here's advice that he has for young players. I would say that the success is gonna come and go, right? I, I think when you're young and, and you, it's so easy to take things personally and it's so easy to just make it, make a drama out of things, you know? Being focused on the work and, and in every form of that word, just being so focused on the work and not worrying about winning or success or any of that and just really being true and honest to the work that you're doing and the the music that you want to make that's more important than anything else for me especially nowadays i find more joy in that now and, and yes you want to make a living as a musician and but i would really tell him that you know just focus on your work don't focus on 10 years in the future where you want to be uh have goals obviously and write those goals down and try and succeed in those goals but don't make that all it's about and whether or not you get into this festival or that festival and getting so down on yourself because, you know, we're so lucky to be doing this anyways. And I think we forget that so much of the time you forget that you're just so lucky to be doing this and be a part of this life. So, you know, just focus on the work, feel grateful, work really hard, take responsibility for yourself. That's, you know, that's another big one. Take responsibility for the work that you do. 
Adam Booker, who, when I chatted with him for the podcast, was teaching at the University of Minnesota Duluth. He's now at Appalachian State University. He has this very uh, raw and honest and wonderful advice that he would share to his younger self. There's a lot of things that I've wanted. Uh, I'll, I'll go full disclosure, and you please go ahead and feel free to include this. I'm going to get really, really personal right now. You know, I'm I, I consider myself a recovering alcoholic. I'm a very regular church goer. I've gone through lots and lots of therapy to really get in touch with what 20 year old Adam did with his life, mm -hmm. right? And this is all very recent in the past couple of years. I don't really, I've already had that discussion with 20 year old Adam, you know? Okay. I've gone inside the cave and, and we had a nice long chat. And everything that 20 year old Adam did created 38 year old Adam. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I, I, can't tell, I can't tell 20 year old Adam to do anything. 20-year-old yeah. Adam's 18 years ago. What would I tell 38-and-a-half-year-old Adam? What I try to tell myself <laughs> every day is just be a good person and not just not just worry about creating great bass players but creating great people because great people make great bass players. We'll close out this highlight episode of advice for young musicians, advice for your younger self with Renan Meyer, who has been on the podcast over the years several times. This was recorded backstage at a concert that I was just randomly playing in the orchestra for. And I thought, what a perfect time to catch up with Renan. This is literally 10 minutes before the concert starts. You can actually hear the 10 minute call if you listen really closely. And this is great, uh, great advice to close out this show. I really hope you enjoyed this show. I could do another five to 10 like this with other advice from guests. This is just a sampling of some of the 500 plus episodes we've done so far. So here is Renan's advice. Advice. We could talk about this for our entire life right. and lives, and then probably, you know, uh, it's going to be completely different 10 years yeah. from now to, to 10 years after that and 10 years before. So there is no real path. Um, uh, but it is my feeling, and this is not the feeling, but it's my feeling that uh, music just makes it better. It just makes it all better. And, uh, you know, if you're doing music, if you end up being a professional musician, uh, if you're fortunate enough to be doing that, or if that's just the path and the trajectory that you end up arriving at, great. But if you play music and you end up doing something else, you still got to do music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How spectacular. And I've never met someone that has done music that is doing something else that says, gosh, I really regret having done that. The path to doing music, the discipline that teaches you, um, the passion that you should find within it uh, is empowering to anything else that you can do in your life. I think what's important is to not necessarily think about training the next Heifetz or the next Michael Jordan, but think of it as something that is a tool to your benefit and your development as a person. And if it ends up being that you're the next Heifetz, great, but doesn't mean that you have to be. Look, in music, uh, there are some high expectations. When you go to pick up a basketball, most of the time you think, let's have fun. You know, let's get that thing in the net. Let's pass the ball. Let's play with our friends. With music, a lot of the times, not all the time, but a lot of the times, okay, I'm picking up the instrument. I need to be the best. I need to be Edgar Meyer. I need to be Heifetz. I need to be a legend. What pressure to put on yeah. yourself. So it doesn't have to be that way. And fortunately, I was always taught that it was a lot of fun. Yeah. And I think it, it needs to be that. There you have it advice for young musicians, advice for parents of young musicians, advice that you might give yourself and that these people wish that they had given themselves when they were younger. I love doing highlight episodes like this, so I gotta give a shout out again, I did it at the beginning, but to Krista Copper for helping to organize all this stuff and go through and catalog when topics were talked about and these evergreen topics like this, right? We're not talking about when your next album releases, we're talking about life lessons, and I get so much out of 
conversations like this and moments in conversations like this. I want to do as many of these as I can. <laughs> the reality is time, of course. Uh, we all have limited amounts of time, and I am being pulled in so many different directions. So I, but but thank you to Krista and the other people that help do this podcast. I, I almost certainly would have quit uh, about a year ago if I didn't get the help that I have doing this. And so I want to give a huge shout out to everybody who actively helps, which includes the team. The team is Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring, as well as Krista Copper. So those five people are right now the Contrabase Conversations team. If you would like to get involved in some way, I have some very clear ways that people can help. Um, people ask a lot, how can you help? I guess I'd say the, the biggest thing you could do right now is just continue to spread the word. Do we have a big audience? Yes. <laughs> Probably the biggest... Uh, instrument specific audience certainly in the classical music world i think that's a fair assumption um do most people know about the podcast i would say almost certainly not it's still got to be under 50 percent of bass players and probably under one percent of other musicians and are there people even if they're not bass players that would get something out of an episode like this heck yes right so spread the word far and wide be that social media or forwarding an email or getting on our email list which you can do at contrabaseconversations.com and then <laughs> forward those emails anything like that share the love spread it far and wide find a favorite excerpt and share it and that would be so great I am your host, Jason Heath, the guy who started this hot mess back in 2007. So I appreciate you being on board, and we will see you again soon with more life on the low end of the spectrum.